We have had many consequential elections in our 150-year history, but a new book suggests there may have been none as important as the one held 100 years ago yesterday. Canada was mired in the First World War, having just suffered tens of thousands of casualties at Vimy and Passchendaele. Russia was undergoing a cataclysmic revolution. And Halifax had just seen 2,000 killed and half the city wiped out thanks to a massive explosion in its harbor when two ships collided. Those events set the scene for embattled nation, Canada's wartime election of 1917, and one of its co-authors, Ryerson University professor Patrice Dutil, joins us now. Great to see you again. Thank you very much. And congrats on the book. It's a terrific read. Just Thank reads great. Much. But let's set, you know, I suspect a lot of people watching us were not alive when this election happened, so we're going to set the scene. Who's the prime minister of the day? Sir Robert Borden. And what party is he in? He's the conservative, he's the conservative um, uh, leader, the, the leader of the conservative party, but in December of 1917, he's the leader of the unionist party. We'll get to that in a second. Yes. Unionist is a new thing. Does he have a majority government? Yes, he does. He does. Who is his leader of the opposition? Sir Wilfrid Laurier. Laurier is, of course, one of the great iron horses of politics. He's 76 years old at the time. Yes. And he's already won four majorities in a row, but he lost the last election. So is this sort of last chance for him? Well, he's 76 years old. It is going to be his last chance, for sure. And uh, he knows it. He knows it and he feels it. And by 1917, how long had this parliament lasted? Since 1911. So it had, been, it had been almost six years. There was a notion, however, I read in your book, that it was somehow inappropriate to have a very partisan campaign in the middle of this war where thousands of Canadians are dying on faraway battlefields. So how much support was there for the notion that any election still ought to be postponed until the war was over? Not a whole lot. There was a feeling in Britain, for example, Britain had put off elections for a long time. And many people thought that we should follow the British example. In 1916, uh, the agreement had been struck between Borden and Laurier to delay the election. Borden tried again. He hoped for, to avoid the election uh, in 1917, but Laurier said, no, we have to go. You need a mandate uh, to pursue. And Laurier had still the feeling that he could win. He still thought he could win. At 76? At 76, well, the, you know, the, the government was very unpopular. These are terrible, terrible years, and I think we have to, I mean, you, 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 you've identified a lot of the factors. Uh, we lost 10,000 kids, 10,000 10, dead in 1917 alone. That's on top of the other 25,000 who died before. Uh, the economy was doing terribly. The, the prices were going up everywhere. The government was often accused of incompetence. This was not a good year for Canada. It was not a good year for the government. So Laurier thought, you know, this is my chance to, uh, to present something to the Canadian people, an alternative, and, and maybe defeat Borden. And actually, the year before this, let's put this picture up, Sheldon. What happened the year before this? Yes. <laughs> well, yes. A terrible event happened in early February of 1916. The, the center block of the, uh, of the parliament buildings uh, went up in flames. Uh, one MP died. And um, it was a terrible thing. It was a, we used that as a cover. It really is symbolic of the difficult, difficult years of Canada uh, in the First World War. Okay. There were also, Patrice, terrible English-French relations in this province of Ontario 100 years ago because of something called Regulation 17. What was that? The idea, this was a, a regulation passed by the government of Ontario that essentially outlawed elementary school in French. Um, it was passed in 1912, had been brewing for a number of years, and had the uncanny ability to rear its head every time there was a crisis in the military, and a crisis in our war effort in Canada. So in 1914, for example, in September of 1914, when we are just about uh, starting the, the war effort, uh, an event happens over in Ottawa over Regulation 17. The school board uh, is severely divided over the application of Regulation 17. It goes on and on like that throughout the war years, constantly fueling the argument that French Canadians should not be fighting abroad when their rights as Francophones uh, are being denied. I want to make sure we understand that. It was illegal to teach French in public schools in Ontario. In Ontario. And of course, the, the ground zero for that was Ottawa, where mm -hmm. there's the greatest mass of Francophones in Ontario at the time. So how much of the antipathy to the war from French Canadians was because of the way English Canada was treating Francophone schools? A lot of it. A lot of it. I think that 
I mean, you can imagine in, a, in an alternative scenario where the Ontario government would have said, you know, this is silly, which is what they did in 1929. Uh, this is silly and it's not going to work. Uh, had the federal government awakened to the realities that, you know, there's something going on here when the Francophone minority, which constitutes 10% 10, 10 of the population in Ontario at the time, is being denied the right to its own education. Uh, guaranteed in the Constitution. Guaranteed in the Constitution. Well, guaranteed as Catholics, but I mean, still, had been, had been a part of Ontario's fabric since the days of Edgerton Ryerson. Mm -hmm. Why suddenly deny the rights of Francophones to have their kids taught in French? It made no sense. So, of course, in Quebec, they make great hay out of this uh, that is completely incompatible with, with this idea of serving abroad, of serving the empire, when in English Canada, you're actually denying the right of citizens to educate their kids in their own language. Okay, back onto the issue of the Prime Minister and his government. February 1917, Borden goes to Europe for a few months. Yes. He's away from Canadian politics for a few months. Hard yes. to imagine that happening today. Well, uh, it would. it yeah. wouldn't. <clears throat> what was he doing over there? Well, he, he attends the, uh, the, the War Cabinet in, in London. Uh, this was organized by David Lloyd George, who's the, the new Prime Minister uh, in England, in Great Britain. And Lloyd George has this idea that uh, he really wants to bring in the, um, the, the members of the British Empire to redouble the effort against the Germans. And so uh, Borden goes there and comes out of it with the uh, notion that Canada has to raise its uh, armed forces to half a million people, half a million men. He'd, all, he'd often su suspected, we, we have traces of his suspicions that he was going to do that anyway. But he comes out of Europe, the Battle of Vimy is raging. Uh, the losses are enormous. And so he comes back to Canada in early May of 1917 uh, and says, we, we have to raise the contingency. We have to raise the, 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 the military forces of Canada. And we're going to have to think seriously about conscription. Well, that was, yeah, I was going to get to that. Two big things coming out of that meeting. One is the notion, I guess, that, that Canada is an autonomous nation, which was a new thing, uh, not just, uh, you know, doing whatever the empire said. And the other is that Borden essentially changes his mind on conscription, right? Initially, he said, we won't do it. He's persuaded now that he has to? Yeah. I mean, he, he, they, he promised up and down that conscription would not be necessary, always hoping that enlistment would continue to grow. But in 1916, it really flattens out. And it's, uh, it becomes consensus that French Canadians are not enlisting. I mean, and, it, and it's undeniable. French Canadians are not enlisting at the same number as English Canadians, and in particular, British-born English Canadians. So the, the issue starts to fuel, and uh, Borden is in a real conundrum. He wants to raise the, uh, the Canadian forces uh, in Europe and sees no other choice. Here's you in the book. For many Canadians, it was unthinkable at the height of the war to hold a partisan election campaign that would only divide Canadians, weaken the subsequent government, and potentially devastate the Canadian war effort. The creation of a coalition government containing the best individuals and representing the whole country was widely considered as one way to address the problem. Its formation could preclude the need for an election altogether or at worst, simplify the choices and remove partisanship from the campaign. For an increasing number of Canadians, it was time to remove partisanship so a truly national government could focus all its energy where it belonged on the national war effort. So Borden pitches Laurier on a government of national unity. What's the response? No, he says no. As I said, he wants to take his chance. The British example is not good enough for Laurier. He says, no, we need to test this government. This government needs legitimacy, and it doesn't have it right now. It has to go to the poll, to the polls. And Laurier wanted no part of any uh, Borden government. So one of the things Borden does is cook the books. Uh, let's explain this a little bit. Every government, of course, tries to do whatever it can to make sure as many people supporting it come out. Yes. The old expression, as you say, is the people choose the government. This time, the government chose the people. Yes. Explain. Well, it really, after he's rebuffed by Laurier, um, Borden does present the, uh, an act to introduce conscription, and he knows it's not popular. He knows it's not popular, and he doesn't want to take a chance. More than that, he doesn't want to take a chance. So he introduces the Wartime Elections Act, and in that, there are two main features. The first one is to remove the franchise to any immigrant to Canada since 1902 from belligerent countries. So even if, if they're you, citizens? Even if they're citizens. It doesn't matter. They can't vote. They cannot vote. They've been, their, their right to vote has been removed. They may have voted in 1908. They may have voted in 1911. They are no longer eligible. So we're talking about Germans, Austrians, that kind of people. 
More than that, he also gives the vote to women who have a relation enlisted in the war effort. So you can imagine what this, what this has. If you're a father, if, if one man is at the front or is enlisted in the army, his mother, his sister, if he's married, his wife, his daughter, all have the right to vote. And they tended to be conservative. Well, the, the, the logic, the theory in Borden's mind and the, the conservatives at the time was that, yes, somebody who has a relation at the front will want to vote for the boys, will want to support the boys. They, the corollary to that, of course, is that if a woman does not have a relation in the war effort, so if she's French-Canadian or happens to be German or whatever, um, she does not have the right to vote. So the, the, the net effect is that French Canadians are robbed of an opportunity to vote, and as I say, immigrants arriving to Canada in 19, since 1902 also. This is, I mean, am I wrong? Is this not an astonishing cooking of the books here? It's, it's unprecedented, yeah. and um, it is, it's, um, it's the most cynical move imaginable, here, undeniably. Here's how it's described by Oscar Skelton in Sir Wilfrid Laurier's biography, quoted in your book. It was frankly a stacking of the cards a gerrymander on a colossal scale, an attempt without parallel except in the tactics of Lenin and Trotsky to ensure the dominance of one party in the state. What was the effect of the gerrymandering? Well, it worked. Uh, the net effect was that uh, in, in ridings that would have been uh, very tight, uh, where Francophones uh, dominated or where um, Germans were thinking of Kitchener, which, which, which was Berlin until mm -hmm. 1916, um, those are going to be much tighter races than they would have been. Uh, the net effect for us, the way, the way we, David McKenzie and I have perceived it, is, is really on women. We see a massive turnout of women, far exceeding what had been anticipated, and they vote en masse in favor of the conservative government. There's no other, of the unionist government, I'm sorry, the unionist government, because there's no other way to account for such a, a, a disproportionate uh, win on behalf of uh, the war effort, on behalf of the unionist government. You make an, a, a distinction now between the conservative and the unionist yeah. government, so let's better understand what that means. Because, okay, Laurier rebuffed Borden, but that didn't mean there weren't other liberals who decided to come over. Precisely, Explain that. precisely. So after he's passed the Wartime Elections Act, and he's also passed the, uh, the law that will require conscription, that will require men to register, uh, he turns to liberals. So Sir Wilfrid has denied me. There are a whole lot of other liberals in that camp. And he, Borden and his, uh, the members of his cabinet were, will assiduously pursue other liberals. And they'll find them not so much in Laurier's caucus, but they'll find them at the provincial level. And the arch... A uh, liberal in that regard is Newton Rowell, the leader of the opposition in Ontario, the liberal leader of the opposition in Ontario, who really wanted a strong war effort. Uh, and, and from there, Sifton out west, Sir Clifford Sifton, um, a whole bunch of other former liberals, liberals that are very active at the provincial level, will join the unionist uh, government, will be given seats in cabinet, and will present a front uh, when the, uh, the writ is finally dropped. So they're not conservatives. They, no. They're still liberals. They will be called liberal unionists, yes. They sit in the government of Canada as liberals. As, well, li as unionists. As unionists, yes. okay. Yes. Now, clearly Borden is trying to sort of create a new, I don't know if political party is too strong, but a new movement of some kind. New political party, I think, mm -hmm. is, is not wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a new vision of, of Canada at this point that the, 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 the war had been so severe that we couldn't go back to the old style politics. This was in Borden's mind. Uh, again, Laurier thought very differently. Uh, he, he was quite comfortable with the old politics and he knew this would end and that uh, eventually uh, those people who had pursued the war effort and the way they did would have to be held accountable. He did not want to be held accountable for that kind of a war effort. He was betrayed. Uh, a lot of people uh, you know, were, felt sorry about it, but um, they said, I'm sorry, Sir Wilfred, uh, we have to join the union government. The cause is too big, we need to support Britain, and uh, we're going to fight uh, to do that. So Borden, as the head of a unionist government, goes to the polls 100 years ago yesterday, facing off against Wilfrid Laurier. Turnout was more than 86 percent. Yes. Highest ever? Highest ever by far. Uh, the, the closest to match will be the, uh, the Diefenbaker-Pearson uh, contests hmm. uh, 50 years later. Uh, unmatched. Uh, unmatched before, unmatched since. Uh, and again, the, the reason for that, we suspect, uh, David McKenzie and I, uh, because of women. Women just turned out in such numbers, such an unanticipated numbers, that uh, it had to, 86.2% uh, 
two percent mm. showed up. So let's dispense with the suspense. Who won? Well, yeah, the unionists did. You had to vote. Yeah, yeah. You had typically you had four four people, uh, four four items uh, on the ballot. You had the the government, the opposition, and the labor. Uh, or, or, or an other. I mean, it was a very simple ballot, mm -hmm. but it was government or opposition. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they, the, uh, the unionist government uh, took 60% of the vote, the liberal opposition 40%, which is a huge gap, yep. again, for a two-party system, a huge gap. Uh, and the unionists won, the, uh, obviously, the, uh, the seats, uh, formed a, a majority government. And soldiers voted too. Soldiers voted too. Overseas. Overseas. It took a lot longer to uh, calculate their vote, and there was a lot of controversy about that, about the way they were, they were allowed to vote. Um, eventually, things were fixed. The turnout among soldiers was about 70%. Uh, over 230,000 uh, soldier ballots were counted, and uh, they voted 90%, of course, 90% in favor of the, uh, of the union government. Hmm. Okay. English Canada clearly likes its unionist government. They clearly are backing Borden. Quebec, anti-conscription, not so much. How close did Quebec come to separating from the rest of Canada on its 50th birthday? Uh, very close. We, we, we argue very close in the sense that there was such fury in the land that um, for the first time, in our, 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 our confederation, Quebecers are, are adamantly asking, are we a part of this nation or not? In September of 1917, among many riots that are happening in Montreal, we found a speech, a young, a young poet gives a speech and he says, I'm no longer a French Canadian. Je ne suis pas Canadien Français. Je suis Canadien Québécois. Hmm. For the first time, the first time you see this emergence of a new identity, as a Quebecois. And of course, two weeks, three weeks after the election is held, there's going to be a motion presented in the Quebec legislature that simply says, given the, the results of the last election, there's obviously a discord among, between French and English uh, Canadians, and maybe it's time to think seriously about leaving Confederation. There was a motion before the National Assembly to leave Canada. Yes. Well, to, to debate it, to discuss it. That motion was withdrawn, but it was tabled. Hmm. And it was not voted upon, but it was tabled. This is called the Francoeur motion. And it's symbolically very important because it's the first time you see a, a fundamental pause about confederation. Like the, 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 election, the election was a, such a searing, searing experience that even the legislators in Quebec had to ask the question. Now, Lomer Gouin, the premier of Quebec, intervened, worked the back rooms are really hard so that this thing did not come to a, a vote. Uh, and he succeeded. He, he gave a great speech uh, defending Canada and saying, basically, you know, we will get over this. He proved to be right. He proved to be correct. But it took an awful lot of arm twisting for that motion not to go forward. And mind you, if those were the initial seeds of separation, they, they didn't go away. They no. came back again. Of course. And they and may come course, back again. And it came back. It came back. Not so much, Steve, not, 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 not so much for the war effort. The war effort, again, was that searing experience in the French-Canadian imagination. But it was also the, the, the unresolved issue of Regulation 17 in Ontario. Mm. The nationalists who emerge out of the First World War, uh, Action Française, for example, a journal that comes out of, uh, out of Quebec, emphasizes what is happening in Ontario. Not only this, this terrible war experience, but also this unresolved issue in Ontario. And that will fuel the, uh, the, the, the beginnings of, uh, a, of a separatist mentality. Again, those first 50 years of Confederation are not entirely happy. We have school crises in, in New Brunswick. We have school crises in Manitoba. Manitoba yeah. We have Alberta and Saskatchewan in 1905. Uh, and again in Ontario in 1912. It's not an easy cohabitation, but it still works. It still works. And in the end, we survived another 100 years. And that's a good sign. I think it's a... Uh, it's a result of, of, of really, really clever politicians. But I think if memory serves, it was only a couple of years ago that the government of Ontario finally apologized formally for Regulation 17. 2016, that's right. 2016, okay. Yeah. More recently than I thought. Yeah. Uh, let's do some quick updates here on what happened to the major players. Robert Borden keeps his prime ministership. How long did he stay in politics for? He'll stay until 1920. And we'll leave uh, for uh, we'll leave the post and give and uh, Arthur Meehan will replace him. Arthur Meehan, who was a key architect of this victory, he was the attorney general for the government and uh, is the one who pilots all these major laws 
Wartime Elections Act and um, the Service Act in 1970. He wrote the conscription bill. He wrote the conscription bill. Very, a very clever young man and who'll fight uh, uh, a really great battle in 1925, 1926. Actually, uh, uh, could have won in 1925. I mean, uh, a, a powerful politician in his own right. What happened to Wilfrid Laurier? He died 14 months after the election, uh, dejected, depressed. Um, you know, it's actually rare to see this, uh, but he wrote to one of his uh, friends, uh, you know, I'm depressed, I'm, 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 bar I'm, I'm, now, I'm now getting the reaction. He writes this a couple of weeks after the election. I'm now reacting and I'm, I find myself depressed. Mm. Yeah, he's 76 years old, he's, you know, he's been a part of, 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 of Canadian debate since the 1870s. And um, he, 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 he dies dejected. He, he dies feeling that his career was a failure, uh, which is very sad. And if I remember reading this accurately, neither Borden nor Laurier has any children. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And you know, uh, this was actually, uh, it was always, it, it was leveled against both of them during the, uh, during the, second, the First World War. You know, Laurier, wanted participation. He always supported Canada's participation in the war. He never argued against it. He did not want conscription. Uh, and a lot of people said it's interesting how the Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition, the Minister of Finance don't have children. Um, and that was, you know, for those people who were against conscription, who were against the war effort, uh, this kind of stinging remark uh, that was often leveled. Hmm. William Lyon Mackenzie King yes. was a guy who ran in the 1917 election, 100 years ago yesterday, and he lost. But it, that was not the end of him, was it? No, uh, because Mackenzie King is a very clever student of history. And all these things that happened uh, are, are recorded in his mind. And so when he manages the Second World War, the Canadian effort in the Second World War, he'll remember what he learned. He will call an election in 1940, as soon as the election is called. Borden thought about it, hesitated and, and decided against it. In 1940, Mackenzie King says, I'm not repeating that mistake. We're going to the polls and promised there will be no conscription outright. It's the only time he was ever clear about anything. We will <laughs> not have conscription. But then, of course, things got worse and Mackenzie King had to renege on his promise. But he said, we'll have a referendum, which is what Sir Wilfrid wanted, a referendum. And in 1942, he asked the Canadians to allow him to renege on his promise. Of course, the result was entirely predictable. English Canada said, yes, go ahead. French Canada said, absolutely not. But the gesture what mattered. The gesture of going to the people really made a difference. And time played in his favor. By the time conscription was enacted in 1944, the war was essentially in its last days. So he replaced so, Laurier as liberal chieftain? Yeah, I should say, yeah. 19, in 1919, he replaces and learns the lessons and will survive. Uh, and the Liberal Party will survive because of that wisdom. And he only went on to become the longest serving prime minister ever. That's right. I think in the whole British Empire, actually. I think so. I think I he think still so. holds a record. Yeah. Okay, here's you at the end, you and your co-author David McKenzie. The election of 1917 was fought on the issue of conscription, but it was decided on the basis of identity. Never has an election so divided the country. Never before or after did the country come so close to the brink of destruction. Never had it endured a moment so marked by rancor and violence. That Canada survived its 50th anniversary is a testament to the strong bonds that had been created over the previous 50 years. Links of economics, culture, and civil society that were able to withstand a divisive vote on the very legitimacy of the country. Patrice, let's just finish up by my asking you this. What did you like the most about writing this book? Oh boy. Um, Mackenzie and I tried to bring in the, the lived experience and we drew on a couple of characters, ordinary people, Wilson MacDonald, a poet, a playwright in Vancouver, and the Nantel family in Montreal. And we tried to, to show how the, the, the experience of the First World War was lived by ordinary people. And that was the most enjoyable thing. Remarkably, this is the first book on that election. There's been many studies, small scholarly studies, but this is the first time there's a book on this. And it had to be, it had to be captured. We had to, we really felt as though it was necessary for Canadians to be aware of this, of this remarkable event in our past, a divisive event, remember it, learn the lessons from it, uh, and, and remember that uh, we, we, 1917, we, we think of Vimy and we think of Passchendaele as, and, and Hill 70 as, as, as great victories, and they were. But we also lived through the darkest days of our nation's history, and that can't be forgotten. We have to remember the good and the bad. And the 1917 election was, was a remarkable test of our nation. That it survived is, is a testament to our resilience. 
And I, for one, am very glad that you wrote about it. Thank you. Well done. It's Thank a great you. read. Embattled Nation, Canada's wartime election of 1917. David McKenzie, co-author, and our guest tonight, Patrice Dutille. Enchanté, mon ami. Merci. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.